Hey everyone, it's Brenda back again with another episode of Three Uniques. I have a special guest on today who's been on the podcast before. So this is a take two. We're coming back and we're exploring more around strategy today. I've got Alex Berkman on. Hi, Alex. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me again, Brenda. Oh yeah, it's going to be great. So Alex is a strategy facilitator and now author. His book is just coming out right now, or it's actually out. Um, it's called Secrets of the Next Level Entrepreneurs, 11 Powerful Lessons to Thrive in Business and Lead a Balanced Life, which Yay! Is, yeah, that's amazing, but somewhat a little bit unusual, like this whole balanced life thing, right? Like we just often hear or see business strategy books on you know how to scale your business, how to like 10x your business, those type of things. But now you've tacked on and lead a balanced life. So I want to hear about that. And then I want to hear about like the, the the interest in you know starting this book. But yeah, what's the whole tie into leading a balanced life? I think for anyone who's been around in business for long enough, they realize at some point that it is just not about 10 xing your business. That right. does just yeah. make you happy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and maybe after, like, I don't know, like the family's left you and like you'd have turned over your employees a couple of times. Like you're just like, okay, something might not be right here. Exactly. And I've had conversations with leaders in large corporations as well as with entrepreneurs that run their own small businesses. Mm -hmm. And the conversations always go the same way. We start talking about business and strategy. We later talk about leadership challenges, and then we go into what really motivates you and makes you happy. And when you take these this journey, that's basically also the journey of the book. It's around hard skills, about leadership, and about self-care, and about how to lead a life that is balanced and does provide what you need. And we're just not happy by business growth. It just doesn't fulfill us. What fulfills us is knowing who we are and intentionally building a life around what makes us happy and what what really fulfills us and that is the reason i incorporated these topics in the book um and i just don't believe in the glorification of hassle culture uh, sorry hustle culture and um talking about the next billion that's just not um feasible for 99 percent of the population what we really need is something that helps us lead a life that we can at some point in time look back at and be like yeah that was worth living i like that <laughs> well and maybe also share that with future generations too right so we're not just taking those lessons and having them sort of die with us but we actually pass them on and we start changing the way we think about how business can operate and what we can contribute to the world i mean right. we do have a certain role as entrepreneurs as corporate leaders we do have power we can consciously decide how we use that power for example sure. how do we purchase products and services from which type of businesses mm -hmm. um, how do we engineer supply chains upstream and downstream in a way that they are environmentally and socially conscious and um, contributing rather than taking away from the well-being of people and, and the planet right yeah and we've done that enough so it's time for something different and can we like change the leadership, you know, definition, right. As far as like taking away versus yeah, a leader actually generates and creates something that didn't exist before. That's Absolutely. hugely empowering for anyone that wants to move into leadership or entrepreneurship. Um, why did you write this book? You mentioned that, you know, talking to clients, large and small startups and, and well-established executive teams, Obviously, this was a need, but like, why for you? Like, why are you the one that writes this book? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually write it alone. Um, I had the idea to bring these thoughts together in three themes, in three clusters. Mm -hmm. But there are nine other authors that contributed to the book um, based on their specific subject matter expertise. Um, I know a bit about these topics, but just not enough to really write a full meal if you want so you can read this book cover to cover mm -hmm. front to back back to front you can just pick certain chapters they are all compartmentalized and i think this is also how you will read the book in the future it will sit on your shelf some topics might not make sense for you right now right. just not interested in it but others yeah. will and then maybe in a year or two or five um there is a topic in the book that now just works for you at the, at the point at the in, in your leadership journey where you are at that stage and you pick pick up the book and find a new room and open the door into that room um, and 
it was it was really interesting to bring a book together with um, nine other um, contributors. Oh. It's um, an interesting learning experience for me as an author as well. Obviously, as as the author, you write about forty percent of the book. I would say thirty to forty percent right. um, to weave those chapters together to make sense of the of for, for the reader mm -hmm. when they read it cover to cover. It needs to make sense. You need to have this feeling how one thing ties into the next. And that was really um, an interesting journey for me personally, because I learned so much more about these topics um, that are in the book. So it was not just me giving something um, to you out there, but also mm -hmm. for me personally to learn. Well, I think that's such a great part of the experience then too, right? Not just espousing your wisdom, but that you're also learning from the various audiences that you brought in to co-write the book with. Uh, so we've kind of talked a little bit about who this could be for, but who would benefit from reading this book? Like when you talk about the reader, who did you have in mind? I would say three specific target groups mm -hmm. um, can really benefit from the book. Um, people who lead businesses, small and large right. in general, um, entrepreneurs who just start out, um, especially when it comes to the self-care and balanced life part. Um, this is something that I always try to, to live up to myself when, right. when building a new business. Um, and anyone that leads a business that realizes, I think it's time to learn something new, um, to allow myself a place at the table, if that makes sense. So if you feel you're stuck in your career, there are reasons for that. And mm -hmm. Some of them have to do with how you show up in the workplace. Some of them have to do with um, the subject matter expertise that you bring. And others have to do with the type of leader that you are. And if you want to step up and reach the next level in your journey, in your professional journey, I think this book is a great entry point for many topics. Awesome. I, I can't wait. And those are like, I, I love how this aligns with just the people that I end up spending a lot of time with. So I'm excited about digging into it more. Um, we kind of talked about this lead a balanced life. And so there's this sort of theme around self-care that runs throughout the book. You've got chapters around challenging times, disruption. Um, like it's like, it's just going to be an inevitable part of business going forward, which is interesting because I think back to sort of like my history of reading about business and learning about business. There's been books that, that I've been drawn to that are like, here's the strategy, here's how to lead a team. And then, oh yes, there's like, you know, books on say VUCA and dealing with disruption. But now you've combined all of that into one book because it's almost like, especially after what we've all kind of gone through in business over the last two to three years, uh, the disruption is just going to be part of it. So we better learn it now versus it just being sort of a, a something that you tack on to your business strategy. It's actually embedded in your strategy going forward. I spent nearly my entire life in one business, economic or health crisis after the next. Right. And if we don't realize that the next crisis is already around the corner, we're, yeah. we're not talking about COVID anymore. We're talking about cost of living crisis now. Yes. Um, which was triggered by the Russian invasion to Ukraine and as a result, energy prices going through the roof. Right. So if and, and the next thing that we will see is because of that, a huge increase in individual household debt. Mm -hmm. And that in the end will affect us as businesses. Well, it's affecting people as far just... as yeah, as far as war on talent. And like, you know, you see it, you can just walk down main streets in any city that like there's hiring signs up everywhere. Yeah. And I think it is important to understand these aspects, how they link, how they connect, and then find ways as businesses to use opportunities that come with it and mitigate the threats that come with it. Right. It's going to be so critical to business strategy. I was just actually on a board call this morning uh, with a board that I sit on and hearing the executive team talking about business strategies and, you know, again, sort of like 23 pages of like all these things that they potentially could do. And the, the theme that we were talking about as a board is like, where is the, the risk mitigation? Where is like, again, sort of planning for VUCA and the, you know, this disruption that's going to just be part of running a business going forward. Um, because it's, it's great to come up with new ideas on how to generate revenue or how to, you know, increase market share. 
you have to do that obviously to sustain your business, but just as equally as important as bringing in the revenue, you need to think about disruption and almost like not one is better than the other, but before you do maybe 20, you know, throw a noodle at the wall initiatives around generating revenue, let's get some really good pieces in play in our business operations to make sure that we're not burning out our employees because we're still trying to, you know, run it like everything's just smooth and wonderful and revenue is just going to come in easily versus like, no, we're going to get thrown a curveball this year, maybe a couple. And so we should, you know, really think about those initiatives that we want to put in place to generate revenue as being like the top five initiatives or the top three initiatives that we know yeah. we can cross the, fin- like we can cross the finish line on without, you know, dragging our employees, you know, roadkill on the side of the road. Yeah trying to retain people. Like, it's just, it's not fair to businesses or the people that we have inside them just to think that it's all going to be this utopia. Like we need to plan for this this disruption. And I believe, especially as, as boards of directors, for example, we really need to help the businesses that we serve to hone in on these three to five big priorities Mm -hmm. so that they can allocate the resources that they need if we allow them to go for a hundred different things and throw noodles at at the wall and see what sticks, we're just losing so much in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of frustrating people, because who wants to work on an initiative that in the end doesn't deliver? Um, So we really need to help businesses focus and hone in on the handful of priorities that will help them sustain their success over time. How does this, um, you know, thriving in business, leading a balanced life also deal with some of the societal issues that we've seen, um, you know, come our way and they've been there before, let's face it, diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, belonging have always been like issues in business. And it's been sporadically part of strategic planning and, you know, whether or not it's been a focus of executive teams. Now it seems like the pendulum has swung the other way but it almost seems like it's coming back a bit, like all this emphasis around DEI, um, you know, work over the last couple of years, it's now kind of swung back. I'm seeing budgets getting cut. I'm seeing like less focus on the executive team. It's like, oh, we'll do that when we have revenue coming back in. Um, but it's a struggle, the recession, et cetera. Um, how does that play into some of the work that you talk about in the book? We have um, one specific chapter actually about this topic in the book, um, how to create an, an- culture and uh, a culture of impact mm-hmm. where we um, don't talk about profit at all we talk about um, putting people first and what the benefits for businesses can be right. if we embrace this as part of our identity mm-hmm. the big issue and you just mentioned it Brenda is when there's just the next I, I'm from Germany and we have a nice saying it's just the next pick that's being chased through the village <laughs> and everything that's just the next pick being chased through the village right. at some point the pig leaves the village and it's it's out. And yeah. if we allocate our resources to things just because they are en vogue right now, and mm. that just doesn't work. We need to understand what the big levers are that create value for mm-hmm. us as a business, for our employees, for our suppliers. And we really need to understand that optimizing our the way we operate holds or can hold as much value for us as a company mm-hmm. as having the next big idea when it comes to um, market share increase or um, entering, um, I don't know, new countries with our service portfolio. So it's really about understanding the different um, touch points that leadership, strategy, um, especially those two elements have and how you bring them to life. Um, that's that's also one of the reasons why um, in my next book, which comes out later this year, yeah. I talk so much about why we need to move beyond this topic of purpose. It has been so it has been misused so much. Mm. And we really as businesses need to understand how we can move beyond purpose, how we can create something that is more just an in, than, than just an intent. We really need to create tangible impact in right. order to create a, a lasting legacy as as leaders and as businesses as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Taking ma- taking massive action on our purposeful intentions so that we actually 
see the result, right? We see the exactly. result of our work and ideally that it's impacting more. And you've said it already is that we as leaders, we have an opportunity to generate and give back versus come up with a great idea and consume. So, Correct. Okay. I love that. Um, another book in the making. When are we going to see that? <laughs> <laughs> the book is done. It's uh, it, it, it's currently in, in the production process. Um, it will be out in the fall of 2023. So this year, it's a bit weird to have two books coming out in one year, but it was well, never intended to, to be that way. You got lots to say. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good thing. I always enjoy our conversations. You've got lots to say. Is this something that we're going to see more of from you? Book writing? Um, yes. For sure. I'm working currently on book three and four. Um, oh my gosh, wow. Early stages, concept phase. Right. But um, I'm, I'm really curious about digging into some of these topics. And um, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's even just self-serving because the topics I feel drawn to are the topics I don't understand. Mm. And then by by researching and dissecting a topic for, for me personally, mm -hmm. I often discover links to other topics and I realize... Um, there are people out there that can um, add so much value. So I'm again writing. So my third book will most likely be as the first book, an anthology where I bring other experts on the right. to the table. Okay. And um, yeah, the fourth book will be most likely again, a book that I write on my own. Okay. But I love that because from a business standpoint for your clients, this is a very sustainable business practice because as you go out there and learn about topics that are of interest to you, you recognize, hey, there's 8 billion people on the planet. Someone's going to need this. And I'm going to bring this back into my business and serve my clients more in this area. So it just continually elevates that leadership development with your clients. So yeah, I agree. It's a good sustainable business model. So good on you for you probably already knew that. And you're like, thanks, Brenda, for reading that out. Um, there's some interesting topics too in chapters in the book. Um, conquering love, overcoming death, and still being successful in business. Yeah. So what was the significance of writing that? I love it, but it's like, again, when we go to those sort of atypical business strategy books, we don't talk about that stuff. That's the stuff that like is considered the fluffy stuff. We don't bring yeah. that stuff to work. We got to be these like infallible creatures that don't have emotions as leaders. That's very emotional. It is. And it is actually autobiographical because that what happened to me between the fall of um, 2019 and spring of 2020. So within these six months, mm -hmm. um, I founded a new business. Um, my father passed away way too early from cancer. Only two weeks later, my first child was born. Um, and then we moved from Germany to Canada. Um, that was planned. But was, what wasn't planned is that this happened um, at the beginning and the height of the first COVID-19 lockdowns. Right. So it was just absolute mayhem in my life. Mm -hmm. And sometime, sometimes later, I ask myself, with the help of some friends, why didn't I just go crazy? This was just too much. Mm -hmm. And how, how did I manage to go through that without losing my mind? And mm -hmm. I didn't really have a good answer for that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was the entry point to start digging and to start asking myself what actually did, was there anything that we did differently um, during these times that helped us get through it um, while running a business at the same time? Right. Or what, what, what was in the end the reason why we made it through it? And we, we realized that, especially how I operate, um, I kind of shifted how I approach things in a certain way. And when we started to dig into it, we we identified four specific mindset shifts that helped me get through it. Okay. So I give you one example. Great. Um, I often thought, as you as you mentioned, as leaders, we need to be strong. We need to be the ones that are the rock when everything around us crumbles. We need to stay strong. Um, and I really allowed myself not to be strong. Mm. I allowed myself to embrace these moments of extreme pain when my dad passed away mm -hmm. and at the same time feel pure joy of becoming a first-time father and at, at during these times I just I just paused and I allowed myself to also embrace these moments in life and 
that was a mindset shift. I would say searching for help, looking actively for support mm -hmm. that often in, in, in previous years didn't come naturally to me. So by looking around and realizing that there is a, an abundance of resources that I can tap into that can help me through such a time. Sure. That was something that for me personally was a breakthrough. I mean, there are other people out there that'd be like, yeah, dummy, of course. But for me, this was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And um, I know many other leaders and, and, and business leaders that um, have suffered from not allowing themselves to tap into resources around them because they felt it would make them look weak rather than um, allowing themselves to explore what's there and thereby being more authentic, thereby mm -hmm. allowing themselves to grow and to deal with um, whichever emotion is there. We just need to right. realize we are human beings. I mean, and every emotion is a valid emotion. As yeah. long as we accept it into our lives and deal with it, we can grow from it. And that was something that was really interesting to discover when you take take a look at how you managed through such a difficult time. For me personally, it was a revelation. Right. And like, thank you for being so transparent about it and sharing that Um one of the four that you talk about in the chapter you'll have to everyone will have to go buy the book to get the other three um but you also managed to continue on with your business as you're yes. going through this right so yes. i think that's also an underlining piece that i want to draw for people is that what i'm seeing and you know we've we've seen this over the last like 18 months or so this quiet quitting even though it's not necessarily talked about, it's not like the, you know, the front page of, you know, every single publication that's out there. It's not on Twitter every single day. Now it's still going on in organizations. Again, coming off of a board call this morning, we're, we're feeling the pinch of war on talent. And, you know, one of the things I talked about on our board call is like, how are we, you know, yeah, we're putting in these initiatives and these policies and et cetera in HR, but how are we talking about the fact that you can come work for us and anything can happen in your life and we've got your back. Right. So you have your own business and you realize you needed to do this for yourself, right? In order for you to continue on with your goals and continue to scale up your business. So you you took that lead. But there's organizations out there that have like 250 employees, 5,000 employees worldwide or in one, you know, city center. And it's just like if you could express that to your employees and truly have that show up in your HR policies, et cetera, like when we talk about retaining employees, like there are so many employees right now that are leaving organizations because they think the next one that they're going to is going to be greener. Um, but it's just because they're consuming so much right now, so much like trauma, tragedy that has sort of happened to them in a very concentrated period of time. And, you know, if and we, we, need, and we need, we need to acknowledge that many businesses did a poor job in helping their employees through these challenges. Yeah. And when people walk away I mean, very early in my career, I, I learned something that um, I still keep close to my heart. When when leaders ask me for um, advice, people join businesses and leave their bosses. Mm -hmm. When you join a company, everything is green. You have all the opportunities in front of you. Right. And over time, you have great leaders that support you and others that just don't. Mm -hmm. And when you don't see any any other way out in a business, then you leave. But you never leave the business as such. You often leave the person that did a poor job in helping you right. reach your potential, grow your skills, or just have a fulfilling job that allows you to express who you are as a human being. Right. And it's unfortunate because it's a missed learning opportunity for organizations to go back in and look yes. at how they're developing their leaders, how they're equipping their leaders to appreciate just the human interaction, the compassion that they can develop. And it's not like I think a leader on general doesn't have those emotions, but it's just sort of stripped out of a lot of organizations because we don't address it. We don't talk about it. And again, we don't bring these things into the way we talk about business. So that's why I love your book is that you're bringing to light the fact that we are all, all human. We have things that are going to come up and we're seeing it more and more and we're seeing it. Um, I'll talk about it from a woman's lens, but we're seeing a huge exodus still of women living organizations 
I just got notification the other day that a school teacher in my daughter's school, she's been there for a while and she's such a great teacher. Um, she's a vice principal in the school and she's leaving because she's got an aging, you know, an aging parent in Ontario and she needs to leave Vancouver and move back to the East coast. And I'm like, what could we do? Like, what, like, how could we get ahead of that? Like now she needs to make that immediate decision because something's happened, but how could we actually set up a process inside the organization to say, Hey, you know, have you thought about this and how could we support you if this ever came up? And, you know, and what would it look like to do your job differently? And how could we, you know, start thinking about it now? Because we talk about it from a replacement planning situation. Like we got to go out there and like recruit people. But it's like, if we talked about this with this teacher three years ago, you know, and got yeah. ahead of it. You I'm know, curious, she- Brenda, what are you seeing in the, in the workplace from the organizations that you work with, either on the board or as your customers? What do you see businesses doing differently to embrace this opportunity now that we've seen the trauma that can happen through external shocks what are they doing differently to embrace the opportunities for to prepare themselves for the future i still think it's reactive they're still kind of dealing a little bit of like sort of the tremor shock of covid and you know recessionary times war in ukraine all the things that we've sort of talked about it's still a little bit of the reactionary it's like oh yeah we're not getting the right talent applying for applications it's tough all around we've talked to our competitors they're in the same boat i'm like okay so like again it's kind of i i look at it it's like you know blue ocean red ocean you can keep mm-hmm. swimming in that red ocean of like war on talent or you create a new ocean blue ocean and you jump into that pool and you bring the candidates with you, right? And you share something completely different. Um, but again, it's kind of like, well, we're doing all the same things that everybody else is doing and it's not working. Um, and that's where it's like, I think you need to go back to the drawing board. So that's where I look at your book as being like, it's a new, it's a blue ocean in the sense of like, we're talking about everyday human issues that happen to people, but we don't bring them into the workplace because we expect employees to just deal with them on their own. And our policies, our programs, et cetera, are all dealt with like you being a fully functioning employee when you come to work every day versus that's And I think reality. organizations can start supporting their people by s- just stop talking about or, or using terms like work-life balance. Right. This is just nonsense. There is, there no is not your balance. life and your work. Yeah. If, if, you, if you divide your, your life into work and then everything else, I mean, we're human beings. We bring all our sorrows, fears, joys, everything to work every day. And we take everything that we experience at work back to our private lives. Mm -hmm. And as long as businesses don't start helping their employees achieve life balance, not work-life balance, but life balance, people will always have this artificial separation between what they love in life and Mm. then work. And I I believe that if we could start creating a new narrative around the role of your work Mm -hmm. um, in your life and that you're allowed to be a full person at work. And if we started to bring more companionate love to the workplace, people would realize that work is nothing that just robs you eight to 10 hours a day but it can be a huge source of satisfaction and positivity in your life. Uh, Beautifully well said. And I just sort of stress that word that you said, artificial, like let's move away from the artificial businesses. Like what would it be like, like you said, you've got those leaders in your timeline that got you, understood you, mentored you, you know, and had compassion for you. And it's just like, how do we replicate that in organizations and show new leaders how to create that? Um, If you're a leader in a team and you're 30 years old and this is your first time leading a team, it's like, this is like, we're going to teach you how to lead people really effectively. And it's going to be this way. And people are going to talk about you when you're retiring at 65 or starting up your own business or something like that. People are going to be like, wow, this person helped me get through my life, not just from one career to the next career or get me from one position to the next position, but like help me navigate, I don't know, through my divorce, through the loss of my child, like whatever those big things are that we again, just farm it out to an EAP service or HR to talk about. So I love these conversations, Alex, they always like enlighten me and I'm so excited for your book and your next book and the next book and the next book. (laughs) 
I'm just gonna have to have a shelf in my home One step that has like the Alex shelf. <laughs> so that's amazing. Um, what's a goal besides the book writing that you're working on in 2023 that you can share with our listeners? Because I'm all about helping people with their goals. So I'm curious about yours. I want to serve on at least one more board of directors because mm -hmm. I realized I take so much joy in helping organizations through this different role that I that wasn't a huge part of what I what I did in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I most of the work that I do is uh, strategy consulting, strategy right. facilitation, but that is a different aspect. Um, what really what I really love about serving as a, as a board director is that it enables you to keep the, the really the long-term trajectory of a business um, front and center right. and um, be supportive and devil's advocate at the same time mm -hmm. when it comes to helping organizations allocate their resources regarding to or or in line with what their strategic priorities are like really helping people get their head out of the sand out of the day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. and just breathe and take a different look at the business the conversations that you have when you do that with executive teams are amazing mm -hmm. and you, we, we as board directors can bring the human aspect back into the workplace and can help overcome the artificial separation that we talked about right. overcome that red ocean when it comes to the war of talent and all these topics that aren't necessarily on every executive's mind because very often they are in the day-to-day -day. Mm -hmm. um, that is really fulfilling and I would I, I would love to do more of that work exciting I look forward to seeing that pop up on your LinkedIn profile <laughs> <laughs> So where can um, people find uh, the book and find you? You can actually get a free uh, taste um, for the book. So you can download the first chapter for free mm -hmm. at nextlevelbook.co or you go to my website, alexthestrategist.com and find all the information there. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I love to have conversations with people on LinkedIn. It's something that I really enjoy mm -hmm. and uh, just reach out. Okay, great. Alex, thank you so much for being on today and sharing more about your book and just a new perspective on business strategy. It was an exciting conversation with you, Brenda. Thank you very much. And remember everyone, I always say this at the end of my podcast, uh, get out there and share what makes you unique, just like Alex has done today. There's 8 billion people on this planet and somebody needs what you've got.